All right, uh, so respiratory system is our uh, breathing system. Okay, so it includes the nose, the mouth, the pharynx, larynx, trachea, which is your windpipe, the bronchi, and the lungs. Inside the lungs, you have the site of actual gas exchange, which is the alveoli. Okay, so some major functions in the respiratory system is gas exchange, okay, movement of air in and out of the lungs, the production of sound, so we speak and sing and all that stuff because of air coming out from the lungs through the vocal cords. Also helps us with smell and regulate the pH of blood. Okay, that has to do with uh, your carbon dioxide versus um, oxygen. Okay, you don't want too much CO2 buildup in your body. If you do, you become too acidic. So breathing helps offset um, the pH to keep you more neutral. Okay, this version is called carbonic acid. Uh, which are byproducts from respiratory stuff that you're supposed to breathe out. Okay, the upper respiratory tract, so we have upper and lower. Okay, so the upper is the nose, nasal cavity, paranasal sinuses, and the pharynx. Um, so in a way, uh, you can kind of draw a line around the area of your throat and everything above that is upper respiratory tract and everything below that line is lower respiratory. Okay, so the nasal cavity is designed to warm the air and moisten it before it hits the lungs. It does function as a resonant chamber for speech. If you've ever had a stuffy nose, you know you sound funny. That's because uh, there's some inflammation going on in that resonant chamber. And also it's where in the nasal area it contains olfaction, which is a fancy word for smell. Okay, so we are able to smell because of our olfactory nerve. Okay, the paranasal sinuses we found in the bones surrounding the nasal cavity. They also function as a resonant chamber. Okay, and then they warm the sinus area, moisten incoming air. And you have the pharynx considered throat. In lay terms, that would be the throat area, which serves as a passageway for food and air. Food would go down the esophagus air will go down the trachea or the windpipe. You also find your tonsils here. And you also find your ear tubes, the eustachian tubes will come in to this area. Okay, the lower respiratory tract is the larynx, the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles, and the alveoli. Okay, the larynx is the voice box area. Also routes uh, air and food into their proper tubes. Air will go into the trachea, food will go into the esophagus. You find the Thyroid cartilage here, in lay terms, people call, usually call that the Adam's apple. You also find the epiglottis here. The epiglottis job is to cover your windpipe so that food does not go down your windpipe. Food or drink does not go down your windpipe. That's the function of the 
epiglottis. Okay, the trachea in lay terms is your windpipe. So this is um, where wind will actually come in and out of the lungs. Okay, they are, the, the pipe remains open because of cartilage. So it does not collapse. Okay, the tube stays nice and open. Okay, the bronchi So this will help. Um, so here's the trachea, and then it splits into the right and left bronchi. Okay, so the bronchi are divisions off of the trachea. So we have a right and left primary bronchi, primary because it's the first branch off of the trachea. Okay, as you go deeper into the lungs, you, you, the tubes eventually turn into bronchioles. The bronchioles have smooth muscle and they, at this point, the cartilage is gone. Because it is muscle, they can constrict or dilate. So dilate, the tubes get really big. Constrict, the tubes get small. Asthmatics tend to deal with this. The smaller the tube, the more the constriction, the harder it is to breathe. So they went from this to that. That is a bit rough. So they would take, to, uh, take something like albuterol, or some sort of other um, inhalant to open up the, the bronchioles. Okay, it is innervated by your sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight or flight. And it's also innervated by your parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest and digest. So if you're exercising, Okay, you are in sympathetics, so you want the heart to beat faster. You want the bronchial tubes to open up nice and big. And if you're in fight or flight mode, which is sympathetics, fight or flight, you also want the bronchioles to dilate and heart rate to go up and all that stuff. Because you're either going to fight or run away. Okay, the alveoli is the site of actual gas exchange. Okay, takes up a lot of area of the lung, has a big surface area because of that. It's one cell layer thick made of that simple squamous epithelia. Remember, gas likes to diffuse easily across thin membranes. Okay, we do have a right lung and a left lung. So a right primary bronchus and a left primary bronchus. There's the trachea. Okay, so about that throat area, everything above it would be upper respiratory. Everything below it would be lower respiratory. Okay, so you're seeing the pharynx, back of the throat area, there's the tongue. Okay, oral cavity, nasal cavity. There's the diaphragm that allows for breathing to take place. It's a muscle that's responsible to help you breathe. Okay, we do need a mucosal lining. Basically, all the tubes inside of you need a mucosal lining. Your trachea, your esophagus, your stomach, your large intestine, your small intestine, and so on. 
Okay, if you lose your mucosal lining, you've lost some defense. Part of it, its job is defense. It does this by trapping incoming bacteria and other antigens. Remember, antigens are the bad guys. Inside the trachea area, you find cilia, which are hair-like projections. All these tiny little hairs that line up along the length of the trachea. And these hairs, they move. And so they move particles away from the lung field and move it up toward the mouth. Okay, so they move the contaminated mucus toward the throat where you either swallow it and it's digested by stomach juices or you spit it out. All right, now if you're not symptomatic, you know, people don't really walk around non-symptomatic, you know, going <laughs> and they don't really like spit like that because you're not symptomatic. So we just swallow. But part of that process is you are, whether you realize it or not, um, swallowing things that are coming up from the trachea that your stomach will then destroy. Now, if you are symptomatic, you're going to have excessive amounts of mucus production. And so you will have the, um, you know, the extra phlegm. Okay, on your reading left there, this is a healthy lung. And on your reading right there, this is a smoker's lung. Okay, uh, here's the trachea. Okay, there's the trachea. And then it's, there's that right bronchi, and then the left bronchi tube, and then it splits into the secondary bronchi, and then it keeps dividing and dividing and dividing. And then all this area is where you would find the alveoli, site of gas exchange. Here's the heart. Okay, the heart has been opened up in a cross section, so you're seeing inside the heart. Okay, and you're also seeing uh, the lungs on both sides. Okay, over here, it's a smoker's lung and you can see all the uh, toxins and teratogens and damage and, you know, all the usual suspects that come from um, chronic smoking, long-term smoking. Okay, you can also see the heart opened up here and reflected back. So, um, you know, it's, it's really no secret. Uh, I've never met a smoker that doesn't know what they're doing is hurting. I mean, think about that. You go up to a smoker. Did you know what, that smoking is hurting you? Probably going to cause lung cancer? Like, no, I've never heard that before. Like, of course they have. Like, they know. People know the consequences. Okay. But, um, you know, like any habit, it's on paper. It's easy to quit, right? Well, here's all the reasons to quit. Oh, that's cool. But then actually doing it in real life, yeah, not probably not going to happen. Okay, it takes a lot of discipline and a lot of self-motivation and a, a tremendous amount of will to stop. Okay, so when it when it is cold outside, because we do have mucus inside the nose the consistency of the mucus changes, so you start to get some of that mucus to flow out of the nose. We also have um, veins that are inside of your nasal area. The, the tissue inside is very thin, so the veins are very superficial, which means it will warm the air as it comes into the nasal cavity. So it warms it before it gets to the lungs. Also makes it an easy site for nosebleeds because of how superficially look the location of these blood vessels. Okay, the trachea is the windpipe. It is uh, held open by these C-shaped cartilaginous rings made of hyaline cartilage. The 
Behind the trachea is the esophagus, the tube that allows for food to enter the stomach. What allows food to travel down the tube is this peristaltic wave. So that's smooth muscle contraction to allow food to go from point A to point B, which means into the stomach. On a lateral view here, so a side view of the person, you can see that the first pipe that you come to is the trachea. So all of this is trachea stuff. You keep going behind it and you'll get to the esophagus. That's the food tube. Okay, there is the epiglottis. That is the structure that covers the windpipe so that food is routed correctly into the esophagus. So it covers the trachea. Epiglottis covers the trachea. So food is routed into the esophagus. Okay, here's a top view. So we take a cross section through those tubes looking top down. You can see the hyaline cartilaginous rings that are keeping the trachea nice and open. Okay, behind it, you're seeing the esophagus, smooth muscle that allows food to enter into the stomach. So anteriorly, you would find the trachea, and posteriorly, you would find the esophagus. Okay, the bronchi, which we looked at earlier, so you have the trachea that comes down and then splits into the right and left bronchi. So that bifurcates. Bifurcate means it splits so right there. It comes down anytime something splits, that's a bifurcation. Okay, this enters into the hilus of the lungs. If you look at the lung field, so there's a right lung, there's a left lung, right? So the windpipe comes in and goes into this area. That's the hilus of the lung. That's where all the incoming and outgoing tubes and pipes and wires and stuff come from, right? Blood vessels and arteries, veins and nerves, the wind, you know, the, the bronchi. Okay, the right bronchi is more susceptible to having a foreign object getting stuck into it because it is more vertical. So a foreign object can come in down the trachea and will likely go down the right primary bronchi because it is more vertical. The left is more horizontal. The left is not exempt. It does happen. It can happen, but it is more likely to go into the right primary bronchi. Okay, so here you're seeing the trachea, primary bronchi, branching into the secondary, branching into the tertiary, all the way to the terminal ends. Okay, you're also seeing the blue line is the uh, parietal pleura, and the red line is the visceral pleura. Okay, so this blue line goes all the way around the outside of the lung. That's called the parietal pleura. And then the red line is the pleura that actually touches the lung and goes all the way around the lung field itself. You'll also notice there's a space in the middle of those two, the visceral and parietal pleura has a space called the pleural cavity. Serous fluid, 
So S-E-R-O-U-S, serous fluid, is found in that cavity, designed to reduce friction as the lungs are moving. Okay, the, the right lung has three lobes. There's lobe one, lobe two, lobe three. You can see where the lines create those divisions. The left lung only has two lobes, lobe one and lobe two. And you can see the line that separates those lobes. Okay, we have the apex and the base of the lung. Okay, the apex in organ stuff uh, is anything that comes to a point. And the base is anything that's more broad and flat. So that makes this the base of the lung. That makes this the apex of the lung. So apex. Base. Okay, there's the base on that side. And there's the apex on that side. Okay, the heart also displaces the left lung a little bit because the, the heart does favor the left side of your chest. Okay, we have uh, different respiratory zones. Okay, once you get um, into that alveoli area, you're going to start to get into respiratory zones. So here it is. So that more distal aspect of the lung there, where you find the terminal ends of the, um, the alveoli. All right, so you have the terminal bronchial that eventually um, starts to have all these clusters of grape-looking things on them, which are alveoli. Each one of those things is an alveoli. Um, so you have the uh, the respiratory bronchial, then the alveolar duct, and then the alveolar sac, and the alveolus. So those are the respiratory zones. Okay, when you zoom in and you cut these in half, you'll notice they are one cell layer thin. Allows for gas exchange very easily. Okay, we do, the lungs do have an elastic component to them, a type of elastic connective tissue which creates the stroma or framework of the lung. This is something that people can lose over time as you get older, which makes it more difficult to breathe. Okay, so smoking would be, you would accelerate that process. Um, chronic reoccurring infections, breathing in harmful substances, like if you work in a coal mine, factories, dust, whatever sand. Okay, as time goes by, you can hurt that process. All right, inspiration means inhale. Increasing the volume of the thoracic cavity. You're using the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm to do that. So these intercostal means enter is in between the ribs. So costal is rib, fancy word for rib. So the muscles in between the ribs and the diaphragm are what help allow you to breathe. The inhale part is inspiration. The exhale part is expiration. you exhale, you're decreasing the volume of the thoracic cavity. Okay, also the elastic component of the lungs help you to 
to recoil back to a resting position so that you can breathe again. Okay, when you breathe in, the ribs go up and out. Okay, so if you look at the diameter of this, it's a certain width. And then when you exhale, you look at the diameter of that. It's a smaller width. Okay, you can also see it here. Full inspiration, the ribs go up and out. And then full expiration, the ribs go down and in. All right, here's the intercostal muscles. You saw the red that you're seeing there. Intercostal muscles helps you breathe. Okay, when you breathe in, when you breathe in, the diaphragm actually moves down. The diaphragm moves inferior, which increases the volume of the thoracic cavity. When you breathe out or exhale, the diaphragm moves superior, decreasing the volume of the lung field. Okay, the phrenic nerve, and write this down, it comes from C3, C4, C5, keeps the diaphragm alive. So the phrenic nerve innervates your diaphragm. Phrenic nerve, so C3, C4, C5, which is in your neck, cervical 3, cervical 4, and cervical 5 nerve roots come out of the neck, and then they come together to form the phrenic nerve, which goes down to your diaphragm so you can breathe. So the expression is C3, C4, C5 keeps the diaphragm alive. Okay, also your brain stem, so the medulla and the pons, um, neurologically help you control breathing. The medulla sets the rhythm, pons smoothens out the breathing. So normal eupnea or normal breathing for an adult should be about 12 to 15 breaths per minute. All right, so that you don't keep on breathing in. At some point, the medulla just knows how to switch gears to allow you to go from inhale to exhale, and then from exhale to inhale. So this is a major brainstem function through cranial nerve 10, also known as the vagus nerve. Okay, during exercise, we breathe heavier because the neurological signaling is faster. So when you're um, just sitting there at rest, right, you've got that neurological spark. But once you start exercising, the spark is faster, so it forces you to breathe faster. Okay, simultaneously, heart rate goes up, and then you're getting rid of all those byproducts, the carbon dioxide, and so forth. Okay, so if you're breathing heavier and exercising, it's gonna send an impulse to the muscles to work faster, to work faster. All right, here's the pawns. And the medulla, so those are the areas of the brainstem that are the breathing control centers. Okay, so those nerves come out and go to your intercostal muscles and to your diaphragm. The neck muscles, 
uh, excuse me, the neck nerves, which are C3, C4, and C5, become the phrenic nerve. to help you breathe. Okay, we have chemical receptors in our body called chemoreceptors. They are sensitive to changes in carbon dioxide, pH, and oxygen. Okay, so depending on the amount of levels of these in your body depends on how hard you're breathing at the time. Okay, chronic bronchitis. So chronic alludes to it's been there a while. Itis is inflammation of the bronchi. So chronic bronchitis, long-term inflammation of the bronchi. This is where the mucus of the lower respiratory passages becomes severely inflamed and produces too much mucus. All this mucus impairs ventilation and gas exchange. It also increases their chance for infection. And these patients are known as blue bloaters because their body, their lips and their fingers and sometimes their face and all that can turn blue because of the lack of oxygen. Okay, emphysema is chronic inflammation and the fibrosis of the lungs. Okay, so the lungs start to develop scar tissue, fibrosis. As a, as a result, they become less elastic, especially during expiration. Okay, these people, because of um, difficulty exhaling, they tend to use accessory muscles to help them breathe. So they get tired by the end of the day. They're exhausted. Okay, so they have that flush look. So they're known as pink puffers. So emphysema, pink puffers, chronic bronchitis, blue bloaters. Right, asthma is difficult to manage. It's about 4 million different forms of it. I'm kidding, there's not that many, but there's a lot of different forms. So it's hard to make a diagnosis, and sometimes uh, practitioners are reluctant to make a diagnosis because um, you know you can grow into it, you can grow out of it, things can change. Okay, the bottom line is a hypersensitivity in the bronchial passageway. Okay, and it can create um, the tubes to go from Big and open to small constriction, making it difficult to breathe. <clears throat> so asthmatics have to be careful to try to avoid things that they know are going to provoke and you know make the tubes smaller. And they should also carry um, some sort of inhaler with them just in case they need it. Okay, TB is tuberculosis. So this is a disease that can affect the lungs. Also pneumonia is a disease that can affect the lungs. Right. These were pretty effective killers until a person took um, antibiotics, which has decreased um, deaths from pneumonia and tuberculosis. Okay, now you can still die from it but we also have better techniques today of saving you. Okay, if the lung collapses, that's called a pneumothorax. Okay, that pleura membrane we looked at earlier, the parietal and visceral pleura have been popped. Okay, they've been punctured from a knife wound, gunshot wound, fractured rib. It can also be spontaneous. Some people it is, nothing happens, just pop. Okay, so the pleural membrane cannot function to increase the volume of the lung during inspiration. So the lung starts to collapse.
Okay, oxygen is bound to hemoglobin. So you have a red blood cell with hemoglobin bound to the red blood cell, right? And then you have four binding sites. Okay, um, so even though that's a blood function, you still need the lungs to oxygenate it, right? So as hemoglobin is bound to the red blood cells and travels to the lungs, you're gonna give up a CO2 and put an oxygen on the hemoglobin binding site. Okay, the, um, the oxyhemoglobin is the area that delivers, is the part of the hemoglobin that delivers oxygen to tissue. Okay, if oxygen is in high demand, it does go from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. Okay, any questions on any of that? Okay. So I'm going to download the digestive system. All right, so the digestive system has two parts to it, the alimentary canal and the accessory organs that go with it. Okay, the, al the alimentary canal, also known as the GI tract, ingests, digests, absorbs, and defecates all the stuff that you put into it. The accessory organs are everything that goes with it, such as the mouth, okay, saliva glands, um, so from beginning to end, okay, it's one big two. Okay, from beginning to end. And that's the alimentary canal. All right, so certain parts, uh, we have the, um, you have your saliva glands, which help break down food, the esophagus, the food tube, the stomach, okay, the stomach, gallbladder, liver, small intestine, large intestine, and pancreas. Okay, so we ingest food, then you chew it for mastication. Then we propel the food through a peristaltic wave the actual act of swallowing is called um, glutatition or deglutition. Okay, peristalsis is how food, now called a bolus. So once you chew it up and start to swallow it, now at that point it's a bolus. And it does move down your tubes via smooth muscle contraction and what's called peristalsis. <clears throat> okay, your, um, some other functions are secretion. So like digestive juices, digestive enzymes, mucus, 
that will help lubricate, liquefy, and digest the bolus. Okay, so mucus is a very important uh, function for you to produce. Okay, it lines the digestive tract, protects, coats, and all that. Um, you can hurt the mucosal lining by taking NSAIDs, which is um, like ibuprofen. Okay, so ibuprofen side effect or NSAIDs, which stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. So NSAIDs can um, hurt you in the long run. They can hurt kidneys, they can hurt the gut, because it decreases the mucosal lining. So you just have to be careful how many of those insects that you take. Okay, water does help make digestion easier. Bile, which is stored in the gallbladder. Okay, bile stored in the gallbladder helps you emulsify your fats. And what that means is, is it brings fat and water and allows it to coexist at the same time. We do have different digestive enzymes that help break down food. Okay, we have mechanical digestion and chemical digestion. Mechanical digestion is like your teeth breaking up the food, your stomach breaking up the food mechanically. Then you have chemical digestion, which is like the digestive enzymes. Okay, then you have absorption, which is movement of food. So at this point, the macro and micronutrients from the tract into circulation, so into your body. So your body can actually use it as nutrients to, for growth and repair reasons. And then there's the elimination. So we do, our, our bodies are capable of getting rid of byproducts. Okay, the alimentary canal wall contains two important intrinsic nerve plexuses, so nerves that help function all this stuff, the submucosal nerve plexus and the myenteric nerve plexus. So these are part of the autonomic nervous system, which means it's your subconscious nervous system that just does it for you. Okay, the stomach has four layers or tunics. The inside most layer is the mucosal layer. And the next layer out is submucosal and the muscularis. And the outside most is the serosa. Okay, the mucosal layer is the innermost layer. It does have special glands um, that help to release and produce the mucosal stuff. Okay, the submucosal contains nerves, blood, vessels, lymph vessels. The muscularis layer is smooth muscle that has different layers within the circular longitudinal to help break down the food. It's kind of like a blender analogy. Okay, so here's how that looks. You've got the inner mucosal um, area then submucosal, then muscularis, then the outside serosal layer. Okay, the enteric nerve plexus, also known as the bowel nerve plexus, detect changes in chemical composition, which means now you have the presence of food there which stimulates smooth muscle contraction. The central nervous system, which is your brain and spinal cord. Um, are gonna help you prepare for digestion, right? So you have these reflex centers so the sight of food, the smell of food can stimulate your central nervous system to prepare your body for digestion. 
and it's a reflex. Right, the stomach is a, a C-shaped curve uh, organ. Well, never mind, I was trying to get the picture of it. So it's a C-shaped curve um, organ that's a temporary site for food to be kept. So it's a temporary storage tank. Also a site for additional food breakdown, both chemically and mechanically. So it churns it, it mixes it, pummels the food. Pretty much like your blender analogy, you can put it a whole apple, a whole head of lettuce, whatever. Just put all these whole foods in the blender, turn it on, and it liquefies it. It's pretty much what your stomach does. Okay, here it is. So here's the esophagus, the food tube that comes into the stomach. There's the fundus area of the stomach. Greater curvature, lesser curvature. All those folds you're seeing is called rugae. That's what helps increase or decrease the surface area of the stomach. Toward the uh, distal end of the stomach, you've got the important structure called the pyloric sphincter. Okay, this whole area is the pylorus. Now, the reason why that's important is because you have all this food now called chyme inside your stomach. Okay, all this chyme inside. And that pyloric sphincter stays closed and will only allow a certain amount of chyme to enter the small intestine at a time. There's that word kind. So once you introduce food into the body and the stomach blends it down, it's now called kind. Okay, the small intestine is the body's major digestive organ. Okay, it's pretty long, up to 18 feet in length. You have three parts to the small intestine, the duodenum, which is the first part, the jejunum, which is the second part, and the ileum. Okay, the pancreas does contribute to helping you break down food even more by releasing pancreatic enzymes that enter into the duodenum, which is the first part of small intestine. Okay, here is a picture of all that chyme, and it's kept in place by the pyloric sphincter. And when the sphincter feels like it, it's all autonomic, it will relax, allowing a little bit of chyme to be introduced into the first part of the small intestine there called the duodenum. Okay, by, so uh, by now all the chyme or that chyme stuff is right here. So a little bit of it is released. The presence of that stimulates the gallbladder to release the bile, stimulates the pancreas to release its pancreatic juices. Okay, and then at that point, it continues through the small intestine and it keeps going, keeps going, keeps going as your body is absorbing and absorbing. And then eventually, it gets to the large intestine, which is about five feet in length. Its job is to dry out undigested food by, it's kind of the body's last chance of absorbing water and then you expel waste. So in other words, you don't want your stool to be loose. But you want it to be solid. The more loose the stool, now you're getting into diarrhea stuff. 
And unless you're fighting an active infection, like you don't want diarrhea. So that is part of your body's um, defense system at first. So in other words, if your body feels the need to throw up, just let it because that means you need to get rid of something that's not good in your stomach. And if you have diarrhea, then at first just let it because your body needs to purge of something like cryptosporidium or whatever. However, under normal circumstances, you should not have loose stools, okay? Because you want the body to absorb the water out of that area and then expel the waste. Right here is the um, ileocecal valve. So that's where the ileum, which is the small intestine, comes in. It also has a sphincter, the ileo valve, ileocecal valve has an ileocecal sphincter, which will release small amounts of waste that enter into the cecum, which by the way, can be very hard on the appendix, which is why the appendix can swell in some people and get infected. You think about some of the food people eat, you know, it's artificial, it's fake, it's fast food, it's processed, it's genetically modified, you know, it's just toxic over and over and over again and just constantly is there, constantly is there. Con so the appendix can get overworked and just starts to inflame and can get infected. Okay, the up part of the small intestine is called the ascending colon. The transverse colon goes across. Then you have the descending colon, goes down. Then you have the sigmoid colon the rectum, and then the anus. So that's where we expel the waste. So you have all this time for the body to absorb the water so it turns into a solid before you expel.